from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. You smell smoke, Johnny? What'd you see? Who is that? This is Henry Willoughby at Four State Mutual Insurance Company. Oh, hi, Hank. And I asked if you smell smoke. Should I? What kind? The kind $5,000 makes when it goes up in flames. Where? Over in Cranford, the peerless junkyard. Junkyard? That's right. But if there's only a $5,000 loss, how can you afford me? Because what I smell is arson. <laughs> In the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Four State Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the peerless fire matter. Expense account item one, a dollar even, cab to Hank Willoughby's office in the Security National Building, where he lost no time in getting to the point. Policy was taken out by one Oscar H. Lehman about four years ago. He's the owner of the junkyard. Address of the yard is corner of Howard and Kingsway Boulevard. And why do you suspect arson, Hank? Our fire didn't start until about four o'clock this morning. When I got here to the office a few minutes after nine, the claim was already on my desk. Almost as though he'd had it filled out and waiting even before the fire occurred, huh? Precisely. How much do you know about this man, Lehman? Well, nothing really outside of the data on the policy. His home address is uh, 232 East 4th Street. Also in Cranford. Yeah. Okay, Hank. I'll see what I can see. <laughs> Item 2, 40 cents phone call to make sure the suspect, or at this point, I guess I'd better call him the client, to make sure he'd be around for questions. Here speaks Oscar Lehman. Mr. Lehman, this is Johnny Dollar representing your insurance company. So why do you waste time at the telephone? Well, then maybe you're coming here with my check for $5,000 right away, huh? Well, you see, there are a couple of things that... So uh... all right, I'll be waiting for you when you come with the money. Goodbye. Huh? Item three, 120 for a train ticket to Cranford. Item four, two dollars for an old rattletrap taxi when I got there. Cranford is a new town, or rather a new one built on what was left of the old. When the big clock company folded up at the end of World War II, Cranford kind of fell to pieces. But situated as it was, just a few miles above the busy city of New Haven, a bunch of smart New York operators had stepped in and were busy making a nice modern residential community out of it. New stores, new homes, and all the fixings. You see that uh, block up there ahead? Huh? It had a big fire there, this day, a big junkyard. Yeah, I see. Man, it was really hot. Thought it was going to take the three houses there on Howard Street along with it. You know, flying embers and the heat and all. But the wind swung around. They didn't even get touched. Yeah. Well, uh, pull up, will you? I want to look it over. Okay, Mr. You're the boss. Hey, you want me to keep the meter running? No, I'll leave you here. Okay. That's uh, 85 cents, uh, but it would have been a buck and a half to where you first wanted to go. <laughs> okay. Hey, uh... Hey, thanks. Boy, how I hate to see that junkyard gone. Oh? Why? Oh, well, that's where I've been buying my parts to keep this old crate tied together. You know something? It looks... Uh, <laughs> now that Peerless is gone, I'll probably either have to get a new cab or either try and fix this one up right, you know, and that costs dough. Yeah, well, happy fixing. Yeah, like I say, though, out of something bad, always comes something good. Sure. And, and I not only mean my taxi, mister, but them houses there, too. Well, what about them? Oh, they're on Howard Street. They, they've been beefing their heads off ever since the yard got its license. So now, no more junkyard. Now the whole place could be residential like it ought to. Like I always say, out of something bad, I'll always something. Something good, yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. I got to get going. Hey, you know something? Maybe that fire gives me a good idea. Like uh, maybe I should burn up this old wreck of mine and the insurance company would have to give me a new one. Hey, how about that? Maybe you'd better be careful who you say that to. Hmm? Oh, sure. Especially not to an insurance investigator Yeah, like well, me. don't you worry, bud. I'm too smart. You? 
You? That's right. <laughs> oh, happy day. In spite of the valiant efforts of Fire Chief Dale Marley and his crew, the peerless junkyard was just that, junk. And he agreed with the camp driver. The other property owners were probably glad to see the eyesore go up in flames. Well, if you wouldn't like it either, Dollar, having a place like that in your front yard. And just take a look at those folks standing around. You'll see what I mean. Yeah, I must admit they don't look very unhappy about it. So the fire started in the shed that stood right here, huh? That's right, yeah. The big shed that Pillis used to store a lot of old furniture and stuff like that. Hey, Peter, huh? hit that corner over there with some more foam. Okay, sir. Yeah, a fellow runs a grocery store on the caddy corner. He sleeps upstairs over it. Said it woke him up. Went off with a boom, like a like a small explosion. Have you considered the possibility of arson, Chief? Yeah, yeah, I have. That's why I called New Haven, asking to send up a couple of men from their special squad. But you found no trace. Nothing I could put my finger on. You got any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, I think maybe I have. I learned a long time ago that a lumber yard or a furniture factory were about the worst places in the world to look for signs of arson. The wood goes up so hot and so fast. And the remains of this shed wouldn't be much better. So I walked over to the little grocery store and spent item five, 21 cents, for a loaf of white bread. And I rejoined Chief Marley at the ruins of the shed. Hey, hey, what's the matter, Dollar? You get to eat breakfast? Oh, something like that. Hey, you want a chunk? Huh? Not without strawberry jam and a cup of coffee. Hey, Herb, take it easy over there. Stomp it around like that, you wipe out all the clues. Now, like I told you, Dollar, the fire started somewhere right around here. Uh And the quick shift in the wind moved it over that way. Uh Uh-huh, Chief. Yeah. Here, chew a piece of this fresh bread. What? That's right, chew it. Get the taste of it in your mouth. What for? Just do it, will you please? Here. Well, you got an idea, then? You bet I have. Here. You... You mean chewing on a hunk of bread is going... Is going to what? Now swallow it. What is this, a gag or... Something? No, not by a long shot. Now watch. Well, don't throw it away. <laughs> now you got my appetite up, I'll have some more. Here now, chew on this piece. What? After you dropped it in the ashes? That's right, chew on it. Oh, now Go wait. Go ahead, do it, I'm serious. Holy... Kerosene. That's right. Well, I'll be doggone. Yeah? Fresh bread will pick up even the slightest trace. Even after the fire? Even after a fire. That means kerosene was brought in and poured over the floor of this furniture shed to set it off. And, Dollar, I'm going to get in the police and have them lock up old Oscar Lehman so No, no, wait. What for? Until I can talk to Lehman. Well, now, look. You look. This isn't any absolute proof of arson. Well, it's good enough for me. It's good enough for a suspicion charge. I'll tell the police what I found out. What, uh, who found out? Well, uh... What I found out. Now, don't forget that. But if it puts us on the trail of an arsonist, if you like, you can take the credit for it. Only if you'll cooperate. Yeah, but Dollar... Otherwise, you'll lose any cooperation from me. Okay? Uh, okay. Item 680 cents cab to the address on East 4th Street where Oscar Lehman lived. Like the Howard Street address, this was a has-been section. Lehman's home reminded me of some of those on the other side of the town next to the junkyard. When the old character let me in, I wasted no time in getting to the point. You ask why I should be staying here in my home instead of at the yard? (laughs) And I'm asking you why not? What good can I do over there? My lovely junkyard is gone. There's nothing I can do. So I'm waiting here to collect the money your company owes me. So are you going to pay me or not? Well, now that depends. As I started to say... I tell you, I didn't even know about the fire till I went down there to open up the gate and start the day. What time did you go down there, Mr. Lehman? Seven o'clock, like always. Well, you sure didn't waste any time getting your claim into the office in Hartford, did you? Of course not. So soon as I see what's happened, I sign up the claim and take it to Hartford. And the office is closed, so I leave it under the door. Yeah, well... What uh... else could I do? Sit around and wait to think about it while the money's coming to me? It's my money, so I should have it. You know how much merchandise I have in that yard? Twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000. Retail? Yeah. Then why'd you burn it up? You think I'm crazy I should do such a thing? Don't you understand now I'm out of business for God? Oh, what do you mean? My, my license for the yard on condition, you know. 
A conditional license? Yeah, that's right. If I'm not in business every day, I lose the license. I lose the lease on the land. Then they, they make houses, little stores. It's a big development company. So you're crazy to come and talk to me, tell me I should set fire. Maybe I've suddenly changed my mind, Mr. Lehman. Maybe I've already met the arsonist. Huh? And I was just too blind to see him. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the peerless fire matter. Something the cab driver had said while taking me to the scene of the junkyard fire had suddenly come back to me. He'd been talking about the nearby property owners, homeowners. They've been beefing their head off ever since the yard got its license. So now, no more junkyard. Now the whole place can be residential like it ought to. Yeah, like I always say, out of something bad, always comes something good. Item 785 cents, another taxi back to the scene of the fire. The men from the department were still busy cleaning up. Their chief, Dale Marley, had been busy with some detective work. Had some answers that seemed to make good sense. Now look here, Donnie. You see this hardware? See this groove in the foundation wall? Yeah. Big sliding door, huh? That's right. And here, the lock was still in a hasp. Yeah, I see. It's hardly likely somebody tried to pull a big sliding door closed and lock it after starting a fire with kerosene. It's too dangerous. Unless he used a wick of some kind. Yeah, yeah, but look here. On the side that faced Howard Street. Street? I just call this an alley. Yeah, pretty narrow from the old days. Now, look here. Well, it's window glass. Right. Yeah, there was a window here. You see, here's... Here's the two parts of the catch from it. The catch was open. Yeah, but the question is, was it open from the inside or outside? And I think I've got the answer. Look across the street. So? Those homes and the little lawns and gardens in front of them. So what? Well, you see the rocks they all use to border their flower beds? Uh, go on, Chief. Yeah, now, look here. Just inside the shed where the window was, I found this rock under the ashes. And Dollar, it looks to me like somebody threw that rock through the glass, opened the catch, climbed in, spread the kerosene, climbed out, tossed in a light of some kind, and left in a hurry. Yeah, but who? That's just it. You got a better idea than old man Lehman? You talk to him. Yeah, I think I have. Like who? I'll let you know when I find out the name. Well, now, wait a minute, Dollar. I hope that last crack would keep Chief Marley from sending the police after Oscar Lehman. Maybe he was guilty of firing his own junkyard. But with only 5,000 insurance, it didn't make sense. And I had a couple of better ideas. At least about people who might have had reason to do it. Three, as a matter of fact. Four, there were three residences on Howard Street facing what remained of the junkyard. Thanks to the sudden shift of wind, they'd received little damage. I walked down the short length of Howard Street to the first old house. The name Howard McNeil was on the little metal mailbox. Yes, well, what is it? Mr. McNeil, I'm Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator, looking into this junkyard fire. Huh. This is a fine time to come around selling insurance after the fire's out. You should know better, young fellow. Uh, no, you misunderstood me. I'm Why, not do you know what would have happened if that wind hadn't changed? It would have set this whole block on fire. That's what it would have done. It would have burned us all out. We'd have been helpless. Yes, Mr. Especially McNeil. Especially that poor widow lady, Miss Cummings, down there in the third house, right across from the shed where the whole thing started. Mr. McNeil. Yes? I'm not here to sell insurance. I'm investigating the fire, understand? Well, don't. What's that? You can stop right now. Just leave things as they be. Don't you know that fire was a blessing? I'm not quite sure I... I said blessing. That fire was the finest thing that happened around here in years. Oh, you like its having happened, huh? You just bet I do. The only way we could ever get rid of that awful pile of junk right in our front yards. Now, maybe they'll give us back our nice little park that used to sit there. Or build a lot of track houses. Yeah, now... all right. What do they do? Anything is better than that wretched junkyard. I've hated it. Everybody's hated it. I hated it. Enough to set it on fire? Yes, sir. He absolutely... Oh, no. Was it me? Well? <laughs> Mr. Dollar, <laughs> Uh, a quiet, peace-loving person like me? Oh, no. Why, I wouldn't even think of such a thing. 
Especially since that fire might have got out of control and burned me out. Well, you carry insurance, of course. I do not. I don't believe in it. No, so don't you try to tell me it. I told you I'm an investigator. Well, why don't you ask that Nazi if he had insurance? Nazi? Yes, that Oscar Lehmann that owned that dirty junkyard. Why do you call him that? Well, he's a German, isn't he? Well, that doesn't make him a Nazi. Well, it does to me. Anybody who'd wangle a license to put up a filthy place like that on our beautiful street, especially if he's a German, well, to me, he's a Nazi of the worst kind, the worst kind, the very worst kind. I think she's a ladies' man, too. All right, now, have you any idea who, besides you, would have liked to see that place burned out? I certainly have. Oh. Why don't you ask the police? They were here at dawn asking us all questions. You said asking us all. Of course, I... Mentioned the widow Cummings that lived in the third house, and, and then there's Miss Gertrude Mary Anastasia Conroy, the nice spinster lady who lives next door, and it's a oh, very charming lady, Miss Conroy. Yeah, well, now would you oh, mind? Oh, and what spirit she has. Now, that's the way I like them, Mr. Dollar. Ladies with spirit. And do you know something? One of these days, I'm going to ask her for a date in, in spite of the competition. <laughs> you never have? No, oh, no, sir, no, no. I'm, I'm not the bold type like some people I know. And I've, I've been working up to it. And how long have you been a neighbor? It's Sixteen years. And you mark my word. One of these days, I'm going to march right up on her front porch. And Miss Conroy, I'm going to say. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mister. Uh, yes, but I was going to tell you, but. Uh, oh dear, I must have said something wrong. Whew. You'd be wanting. Miss Conroy? That's right. And don't you see this sign beside the door? No peddlers, no solicitation. So be gone with you. I'm busy cleaning the smoke. Got to be house for that awful fire this morning. Well, that's what I'm calling about, ma'am. That fire. I'm an insurance investigator. Investigator, huh? Well, now, just a... If you're an investigator, young man, let me see your badge. Badge? That's right. If you're an investigator, you're a detective. And if you're one of them, you're with the police, Mark. No, 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 you... And if you... you are, you can go right back and tell your chief I've had me feel right up to here with answering full questions about that fire. As if I myself did it, huh? Well, did you? For years now, I've connived and connipped it how to get that terrible, dirty, filthy junkyard out of this neighborhood. And now, poor soul, he's lost it. Oh, I could cry my eyes out. You what? Oh, such a lovely old man he is when I finally met him, that dear Mr. Lehman. Oh? Oh, the horrible things that Hitler done to him before he escaped them Nazis that took over his fine old country. And when he got here, he put all his savings in that lovely second-hand lot. Lovely. So he could earn an honest living. I'm afraid I don't oh, understand. Such a fine man. Such a gentleman. The way he'd click his heels and bow when he come calling on Sunday afternoon. Oh, such a gentleman. Uh, wait a minute, Miss Conroy. I don't get it. A couple of minutes ago, you sounded as though you hated that junkyard. Second-hand lot. Oh. And so I did. Until I got to know that nice Mr. Lehman. And I'll tell you this. In spite and despite the fact they won't ever let him set up in the same kind of business again. If it takes every cent I own, I'll see that he gets started in something else. Well, I'll be... Investigator, huh? Insurance investigator. And then I suppose I can tell you confidential that I've set me cap for dear Oscar. You mean you hope to marry him? Aye, and that I will before I'm through. But I got the impression that your neighbor, Mr. McNeil... Oh, that crazy old stick in the mud, that old coot, huh? But if you're from the insurance company, how can I help you, lad, with your uh, investigation thing? Well, you can't tell me this. Was your friend, Mr. Lehman, in need of uh, money, particularly? Uh, well, no. Uh, his business has been good. He drives a nice car and keeps a nice home. But like I said, if he needs more than he's got to get started again, I'll be the first to help him. Besides, it will sort of help to bring us closer together if I'm worrying about him a bit. No, won't it? <laughs> yes. Yes, I guess it will. I just want to oh, make sure. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah? It's so blind I was thinking of me, darling Oscar. So that's what you were up to with your nasty questions. What? Implication that he might have burned up his place by his own self to get the insurance money. Is that what your evil, filthy mind was thinking of? I didn't say that. But that's what you meant, now, ain't it? No, no, after all, somebody set that fire. 
And if he was in need of money... And just because I told the poor soul to get his claim in real quick this morning... You told him? Of course I did. Give him something to do besides standing around in the ruins, crying his poor old eyes out, keeping his sorrows to himself. Hmm. But I'll soon put a stop to that. I'll cook him up a real nice mess of corned beef and cabbage. A German style, that is. And take it over for his supper to comfort and keep him company. And what will you be doing for the poor soul? Uh, well, that depends. Oh, it depends, does it? Well, you and that insurance company better pay up what you owe him instead of making snide talk about maybe he himself set that fire in his... Oh, get out. Go on, get out. Why should I be wasting my time talking to the likes of you when I've got cooking to do for me? <laughs> oh, brother. This was turning out to be the most offbeat insurance matter I ever handled. Well, there was only one suspect left. The woman living in the third house opposite the shed where the fire had started. The Witter Cummings, McNeil had called her. I went up on the porch, rang the doorbell. And again. After the third time, I was about to decide no one was home when the door slowly opened. And just inside the door, in a wheelchair, sat a little old lady, pale, gray-haired. Her face reflected years of pain. I've been waiting for you to come, Mr. Dollar. You know who I am. I overheard you at my window when you talked to Mr. McNeil and Miss Conroy. Listening to the neighborhood is the only thing I have left these days, tied down as I am to this wheelchair. Yes, I see. I'm sorry. Come in and sit down, please. Thanks. There's uh, no one to take care of you here? Only Rudolph. Who does as little as he dares. And you must take him away, Mr. Dollar. Rudolph? My stepson, who keeps me here, waits for me to die. What? Not even a rest home where I'd have care and friends but here to die. He'd help me die, too, if he dared, because of the money. What money, Mrs. Cummings? That my husband left me. A lot, Mr. Dollar. And this... Rudolph wants to get his hands on it? That's all he wants. That's why he wants me dead. But he hasn't dared kill me. Because everybody knows that we're alone here together. And if I should die from his neglect, they'd know he did it. But he's smart. That's why he thought of the fire. He what? He thought that it would burn down this house, too, and trap me here. Mrs. Cummings, do you know what you're saying? The divine providence. The changing wind kept the fire away. He set that fire to burn this house and you? He's clever. He made it known that he'd be away all night, that he wouldn't be back here until he finished his work at the plant in New Haven. But he came back, Mr. Dollar, this morning before dawn. I heard him here in this house... And from this window, I could see him in the moonlight. Mrs. Cummings. No, I must tell you. Quickly, because he'll be coming back from work. His work. To keep up appearances, to keep them from suspecting. His gambling. The terrible people he goes out with at night. Gangsters, that's all. And I must tell you. Because if I don't, listen to me. I must. I saw him. Take a can, the kerosene we keep in the cellar for when the electricity goes out. He took it across the street. He broke the window of the shed and went in. Then he came out. He threw a piece of burning waste back in. Then ran. Mrs. Cummings, are you sure? I lied to the police. I couldn't make myself tell them. After all these years of knowing what he's been and saying nothing... But I thought I'd wait for him. Maybe when he saw his evil plan had failed, that I was still here. Maybe I could make him give himself up. But in my heart, I knew he wouldn't. Because he's bad. All bad. Mrs. Cummings, I'm glad you told me. God forgive me. 
But I knew, I knew that if I didn't, he'd find some other way to... We must take him away, Mr. Dollar. Before he does murder. Expense account item eight, ten dollars, board and room. I've stayed an extra day in Cranford to clear things up. For while I waited for Rudolph to return, I found the kerosene can he'd used down in the cellar. Chief Marley found the top from it in the ashes. The police have since found only his prints on it. Rudolph is in the city jail. And I'm sure Mrs. Cummings will testify against him. After all, her life is at stake. Hoskin Lehman, his claim will be paid in full. Well, I hope he and Miss Conroy live happily ever after. Expense account total, including incidentals on the way back to Hartford, $14.46. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week... Exploration in the high Sierra country of California. And at the end of the trail lies death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Peggy Weber, John Stevenson, Herb Vigran, Hans Conrad, Boris Lewis, and Parley Bear. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino.